We're talking about exercise in a safe environment. And uh, safe environment, I mean, we, we all know exercise is good. And uh, the different environments uh, poses a challenge, right? And uh, we have, we're going to talk a little bit of the stadium environment. Uh, things happening in the stadium. You should be uh, able to exercise safely here. But also, and this is uh, some, uh, this is the Mamba case here, and this is also the Morosini case, where we have different, slightly different outcomes. And uh, that highlights some of the problems to have, have the emergency system ready and make it work. And uh, also you have the mass gathering events that we should also be able to participate safely in. Another environment that we, use, uh, that we are addressing a little bit is the fitness facilities, that people go exercising in fitness, fitness rooms and, and fitness facilities, and also in the corporate setting, uh, where more people are exercising uh, for, for, for health. So, first of all, um, this is a case of sudden cardiac arrest in my country, and we play a game called ice hockey. And, uh, and this is a successful outcome, and it's possible. And in this particular case, this guy who I know was resuscitated by the referee. And he was giving CPR very fast. And actually he survived this case. So, and this is, this is one case of a successful, successful outcome. But uh, is this going to be, can this be organized in, in an organized way for all settings? I'll give you some, uh, some numbers from the Swedish CPR registry. And uh, I understand you can't read that, but it says the Swedish CPR registry on the left. <laughs> and uh, on, on your right, it says that around 10,000 cases of sudden cardiac arrest in our country each year. Uh, most of those are caused by, by, by uh, uh, underlying cardiac disease, some, some of drowning and, and SIDS and so on. And uh, importantly, these are the figures, and these you will be able to understand uh, easily. Uh, you can see here that on, on your left, you will see the, the number of people who are get CPR before the arrival of ambulance. And the dotted line is the one who are witnessed, and uh, the, the straight line is all cases. And I can see I'm very impressed by this registry. And I, I should tell you, the Swedish CPR registry now involves 99.99% .99 of all ambulance services in the country. So it's, a, it's a almost 100% record of all events happening outside hospitals. And I think that's unique because that could form a base for, for registries that Eric will talk about later. But the, the, uh, the number of people who get CPR before the arrival of ambulance has risen in the last 20 years from 33% up to 68%. And that probably explains the survival rate going up from 1992, 4.8% surviving up to one month after hospital discharge, and now it's over 10%, 10.4%. Is this any good figures? I think so. This, uh, this, is, this is actually not the same as we can see in the US, where we have the same uh, around 7.6%, but there the, the has no change in survival rate in the last three decades. And also in, in uh, the CARE study, you could have a little bit of figures, 9.6%, which is uh, fairly similar to the Swedish figures, but only 33% of the patients get bystander CPR. So that's a very low figure, uh, and I think we should aim for higher. And importantly, also back to the Swedish register again, we can see here that C the, the early time to defibrillation is the main driving force for survival. This is the minutes for, for, for to defibrillation, and this is the survival rate. And, but of course, early CPR influence in every level here. So when there is early CPR, there's a, high, a higher survival rate. But of course, the time to defibrillation is the major determinant. I think these are important figures and shows that we have to be fast and we have to apply defibrillation fast and early CPR in every environment out of hospital. So for the current state in prevention of sudden cardiac death, you all know that uh, the screening is the first step. And this is the screening protocol uh, presented or, or recommended by the European Society of Cardiology. And you all know this and you've seen this slide many times, family history, personal history, physical ex examination, and 12 ADCG. But we can't find everything on, on screening. So the next step is also important. We have to have a security in the arena. And the second step, if an event 
or, or a possibly fatal event to prevent it from going from sudden cardiac death to sudden, uh, or sudden cardiac arrest to, to, to sudden cardiac death. And this is an example of the equipment now required from the UEFA for a game. We had a, a Women's Champions League game in Stockholm this week, and this is the equipment we brought to the pitch. So, actually, nowadays you have to bring half a hospital, according to the UEFA rules, which is good. Uh, and uh, the, the, the UEFA, the, the mandatory, uh, the, 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 the recommendations or, or the, the mandatory equipment you need to have for the game actually to take place has risen considerably, and this helps us in medical for, for, for improving the service to the players. And if you have a strategy in sports stadiums like this, uh, with uh, the, the additional uh, uh, arrest response system uh, consisting of, of AEDs and, and a, st a strategy for ambulances and transport and, 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 and so on, you can have a very good outcome. This is shown in, in, in this paper from Melbourne showing that 24 out, out of 28 consecutive cardiac arrests uh, were alive and 20 of the 20, uh, 28 survived one year, which is a very high incidence rate compared to, to out-of-hospital figures. Uh, the, the thing here is important that the ambulance always take 10 minutes in every study, 10 minutes to, to the site. So if you don't have a C, CPR and, and defibrillator in place, you will have, uh, have a problem uh, with survival. And 26 out of 28 of these people here were defibrillated within five minutes, and that's the reason why this works. So the authors concluded that we will need a coordinated, tailor-made emergency life support strategy for the delivery of early CPR and defibrillation and also advanced cardiac life support as the third line of support. And this could actually increase the survival in, in, in the setting of, of, of the stadium. And this could also be applied in other uh, places outside uh, where people uh, exercise, of course. And, uh, but the problem is that we're not doing it too well. This is the study we did on 190 soccer stadiums in Europe that we can show that only two-thirds of the, of the stadiums had actually a written medical action plan. Some of the others said they had an action plan, but it was not written down. And you can wonder what that plan was then, uh, in the head of one, one or two persons. Actually, also here, in the, in the stadiums having more than 10 minutes to the hospital, that's the 10 minutes again, uh, 30% of those did not have a defibrillator in place. And or, uh, from these f five minutes interval and up, many of these stadiums did not have a, a defibrillator in place. So actually that led to a consensus document from, from uh, our section of sports cardiology. And this is the important thing from that consensus document, the checklist for an action plan, medical action plan for, in this case, big stadiums. But th this in a, in a, in a, in a, could be adjusted and refined for other, uh, other like mass gathering events or other stadiums or, or other places in schools and so on. So what you need is, is you have a written plan with a medical director and then you would, must plan all the personnel, the equipment, the communication systems, the transportation uh, and collaboration with the uh, emergency medical system and also uh, how to, to do proper training and, and, and when for, for the personnel. And this is what we recommended. And this is actually what now UEFA uh, has as a mandatory requirement for, for the games in, in football as an example. So just again, you need the medical action plan, and I won't go through this again, but it has to be coordinated and integrated. You have to have a person responsible, which is very important, and you also have to consider transportation time. Uh, all this to achieve early, early defibrillation, uh, CPR within one minute and defibrillation within three to five minutes, which is impossible if, if the ambulance has ten minutes to go, you don't have a defibrillator in place. And these action plans should be in, 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 uh, also accessible, not only to the, to the visiting team, uh, but also to the, to the public in a way, to the know that because most people will not be on the pitch, they will be in the stands and in, in big arenas, up to 100,000 people, there should be something in the program actually telling people uh, how to, to, to act and, and where to go. And it works. If you, if you can train non 
uh, trained laypersons with minimal theoretical instructions, you can, you can uh, uh, lower the time to shock from 81 seconds to 50, 56 seconds. You can increase the pad placement and, and the safety procedures. So minimal training for laypersons could increase their, their, uh, their, 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 the, the results. So this is stadiums, but the future challenge would be the older athletes. We have, that's the, the great thing in the future, I think, to, to, to consider. Because we have more mass events. This is skiing, cross-country skiing. And uh, uh, more, more older athletes will compete. Master athletes is defined as one over 35 years of age, sometimes 40. Uh, they, they more and more compete in, 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 in competitions, in running, cycling, skiing. And we all know about many of these individuals. And this puts considerable uh, pressure uh, because if they have an underlying cardiac disease uh, and they, they do this uh, competition, it will be put a strain and it will be a, a, a risk-benefit analysis, sometimes difficult. Uh, so what about sudden cardiac arrest in marathon settings? This is a study from, from the US showing that one in 57,000 marathon runners will die. So that's one in 50,000 and it usually occurs the last four miles. But importantly for this talk, the use of AD improves survival. You can see here that 20 out of 30 cases survived where there was an AD present, only 3 out of 10 when there was not. So again, a structured medical action plan for this setting, the same as the arena, adjusted for the outdoor setting, will help. And this is the more famous study on the marathon running by Kim in 2012. And uh, I want to highlight here that the, the incidence of deaths w have increased over the years. I don't, I don't know if that's mythology or possibly, but also could that maybe the, the risk increases. So it's 2 out of 100,000, the same as the previous study in the last years. So the incidence may increase over time. How, how is that? How, how is that? Possibly because athletes are older and less fit in the races. This is a study from, from, uh, from Stockholm showing the 30 kilometer cross country race, which is very tough, even tougher than a marathon, I would say. And the people who are lining up for this race, they can see that the increase in participation is, is in older. The people who get older who run the race, both men and women, and the running times is getting longer. And this is also for all finishing quartiles, even for the best quartile and so on. So not just the, the last ones. So people are, in a way, older and less fit who run these races. And this is actually very interesting because uh, in South Africa they have the two ocean race. And that's, you have the ultra marathon part and you also have the half marathon. And the risk is actually much greater in the half marathon race compared to the ultra marathon race. Possibly because of totally different types of persons who run these races. And this is important to consider when more and more less fit and older individuals take part in running races. The problem with screening older athletes, though, is that we can't apply the European Society of Cardiology screening procedures so easily uh, as we do for young athletes, because the, the resting ECG is, is practically worthless to, 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 uh, to find uh, underlying cardiac, uh, coronary artery disease, right? So there is a different uh, proposition, more um, pragmatic, if you want to say, uh, to, to have a more, more individualized screening uh, protocol, relying on self-report, uh, self, uh, self-assessment, and then a secondary step, uh, a, a physician, in some cases, uh, positive cases from self-report, uh, self-assessment. So, screening recommendations in older athletes is, is according to the intensity level of the intended physical activity. I mean, if you do marathon, it could be wise, but, but chest, not so, not so important risk profile, and habitual exercise level, which is also important. And uh, this is done, uh, this is proposed very easily to do by self-evaluation, which could be a part of your, your uh, when, you, when you apply for and pay your fee to get into the tournament when, or, 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 the, or the competition. And when you pay your fee, you also have to fill in this. And if it's positive, and these simple questionnaires looking at previous history and symptoms and so on, usually the, the, the physical activity readiness questionnaire, which is a simple questionnaire, and if this is positive, you will need a risk stratification by a physician. And that, if that's 
positive using, for example, the score, you have to do a maximal exercise test, which is still the number one uh, test for coronary artery disease, even though you will have many solutions or, or suggestions in the room, I think, for other tests. So does this work? Also from South Africa, interestingly, but only for one year now, but they had the same survival rate for many years. It was totally stable. Then they introduced this system by screening, risk uh, stratification, and also some, some educational intervention. But self-assessment and risk stratification and, and, the, and, and the, the complication rate for the 2012 race went considerably lower. But they will need, of course, more years to, to uh, look at this. But this is the first sign maybe this works. But it's too early to say it does, does really work. It's just an uh, just implication. So uh, the future direction then. Do we have better screening tools to find uh, coronary artery disease in the older master athletes? Should we use biochemical markers, uh, pro BMP perhaps? Could, should we use ECHO, which is often proposed? Uh, skin tigraphy, or CT angio, which is even more often proposed, or genetics possibly. Just look briefly at these. Uh, NT pro BMP could indeed identify athletes with CV underlying uh, cerebral vascular disease. This is also a Stockholm study uh, by the Salin group uh, looking at uh, individuals over 45 years of age, uh, 185 participants who uh, were, were uh, going to take place in this leading race, uh, the cross-country race. F uh, Fifteen of those had uh, a very high pro-BMP, uh, and of those 15, four were severely diseased. Actually, there, two of them had coronary artery disease, one had aortic dissection, and the third one had a severe uh, a heart failure. And these were people who, who said they were asymptomatic and wanted to compete. One of the even died during the follow-up because they had three vessel disease and, the, and, the, and the, the other one with coronary artery disease was operated on. So these were severely diseased people who were trying to or hoping to run this race. So the NT pro BMP could, uh, could identif identify people with underlying disease. What about the echo? Does it add anything? In this uh, study also from the leading race that was shown that 153 patients were, 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 were screened and 14 of these were identified for needing further testing. 12 out of 14 of these patients were identified by personal history, physical examination, and ECG. So the echo actually added very little, only 2 out of 14. So the echo uh, might not be very useful in this situation for screening for coronary artery disease. Uh, and what about coronary artery calcium then? Uh, this is an interesting study you, you may well know about, for, coming from Merlin Camp in European Heart Journal, saying that if you compared marathon runners over 50 with, uh, with a control group, uh, and you can see that they had a lower Framingham risk score. That's the same as our score, European score system. So the risk, classical risk factors are lower in marathon runners, but the coronary calcium score was the same as in the control group, and if you stratified for the same level of, of risk factors, they were even higher in marathon runners. But, again, what's the clinical significance of this? What, what do we do, make of it? What, 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 what should we make of this? So, the role of CT Angio is, is uh, we surely will get additional info as a luminogram with, with Angio. We, we, we will find non-obstructive plaques which are causing the majority of MIs. We may also identify coronary artery plaque burden, the extent, the type of, of, of plaques and so on. So this is clearly an advantage, theoretically. But, but we have the cost, radiation, availability, logistics, and we don't have the normal values. So we really don't know what to do with the information. What you do with an asymptomatic non obstructive coronary artery disease? What do we do? Should we tell them not to, to, to exercise? Probably should tell them to exercise. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to interpret the results because we don't, have the normal, we don't have the normal values. So when do we, when do we use the coronary CT angio? Is it for, for all screening or after the exercise test and so on? So we have to determine this. This will, of course, be a part of the screening procedure somewhere or the evaluation procedure, but we don't know, really know yet. So we don't know these people. 
You can, you, can, you can start in a cross-country ski race for 10,000 people like we have every year. It's a 90 kilometers cross-country ski race. But we don't screen anybody. We don't know anything about these people. The same in the marathon races here, I, be, I believe. Maybe we will have some answers from a big, uh, big uh, Scandinavian study we're performing now. Uh, or actually it's just in Sweden. But it's, it's uh, going to consist of 10, up to at least 10,000. Uh, they are starting now from November, but up to maybe up to 30,000 people, all 50 to 65 year olds uh, from the whole of, of, of Sweden, uh, stratified for sex and, and socioeconomy. And we did the pilot in 2012, consisting of 1,000 people. They, they do all these tests, and they're going to be followed up for a number of years. So this will actually be one of the largest cohort studies we, we, there is, actually. And we can, we can then look at CT scan in everybody. We can look at the plaque burden. We can look at the, how many of these are, are then uh, ischemic when, when, you do, uh, when you do stress tests and so on. And all these will probably help us to get the normal value. Then we can compare this population to the running population or the marathon population or the skiing population. Then we will possibly know what, what, when to use the calcium score and so on. Just to finish up, uh, just a few minutes about other facilities. Fitness facilities, that's a usual place for people to, to do exercise, right? And it's increasing. And in, Sw in Sweden now, it's the second uh, most common type of exercise after walking. Uh, this is interesting paper came out recently saying that the, the, survive, the risk of, of, of uh, study cardiac arrest is not the same in, in, in each v environment. So actually, the risk is higher if you, if you are... Uh, arrest is higher in, in, in a bowling alley, uh, in, the tennis, uh, in the tennis court, than in the fitness facility. And also, the, the uh, survival is higher in the fitness facility compared to other indoor activities where people are out in, 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 the, uh, in, in the public uh, place, so to speak. So, actually, may, the risk may not be the highest in the fitness facility, and also the, uh, the survival is higher. And this is important because even in a fitness facility, we can use an adjusted medical action plan and, and possibly should use. And uh, many of the uh, uh, fitness facilities do. Uh, we, we don't really know the situation, though. This is a small study from the U.S. looking at 136 facilities performed by Dresner and, and Harmon. And 40% of these had an, a defibrillator in place. 68% had an action plan. But this is a small study coming from, from uh, the Washington region in, in the U.S. What we're trying to do now is uh, doing a bigger study survey in European countries, up to six countries. And this is organized by uh, this section of sports cardiology, looking at taking after from the ARENA study and looking at what is the situation now in fitness facilities. Our goal is to include up to 1,000 fitness facilities uh, up to the end of this year. And we want to look at the emergency response preparedness, uh, the, the, the medical action plans, uh, the ADs and the training and so on at fitness facilities. And just a little glimpse from the Swedish uh, part, and this is just from a, from a master, uh, master thesis uh, that was produced on a, on a little small part of this, 88 fitness facilities, where 43% had written medical action plan and 58% uh, had at least one defibrillator, uh, and encouragingly, uh, the, the CPR certified personnel was in 94% of the, of, of the facilities, and 97% had a designated first responder. So, uh, possibly the situation could, could improve, but it's not that uh, dissimilar from the US. But we will see about the bigger, uh, bigger survey uh, of, of total, uh, or more countries in Europe. And, and, and lastly, corporate facilities, then we know even less. Uh, there are many corporate settings where there is possibilities to train, exercise, the gyms and so on. And we, we really don't know if they use any, any, have any emergency medical plan for these settings. And uh, we are planning to do a survey for that next year, hopefully, uh, organized by, by the section of sports cardiology. So I think one of the, the key issues here that you could use the medical action plan uh, for the arenas and, and adjust it to all the different settings. The, of course, it's different in outdoor mass gathering events and in a, in a, in a setting of a big corporate uh, so, uh, setting, but it, it's possible. And you can use it as a template. So the ultimate challenges and, and directions in the future would be, of course, 
to, to, to get all the benefits of physical activity and still avoid the negative effects like sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death. That, that's, I mean, that's the bottom line. That's the ultimate goal, of course, for what we're doing here and why we're here today. Uh, that could be achieved by better identify high-risk individuals with underlying disease and uh, also to ensure safe participation in different environments, uh, be it arenas, outdoor uh, uh, exercising, mass events, fitness facilities, or in the corporate setting. And, and one way of doing that would be to use the template of, that, uh, of a kind of medical action plan that takes in con consideration first responder, uh, the, the equipment, the, the uh, transportation times, the hospital, and so on be it as a, in a mass gathering or in the corporate setting. So, thank you very much.